Thank you to the organizers. I'm happy to be here. It's my first time at CERM, so it's exciting. Um, so I'm going to talk about two new sections of the LMFDB that we've been building over the last several years. Uh, and um, I want to first mention that this is a collaborative effort with many people, some of whom are in the audience. Um, the, groups, uh, the group's project started uh, a few years ago and has continued up until now and is ongoing. Uh, the Modular Curves project started with a couple of workshops that we hosted at MIT uh, last year in 2022 um, and is also ongoing. So I'm going to show you some uh, the current versions of these, uh, of these databases and they will, they will be improved as we continue to work on them. So first, I would encourage all of you to pull out your laptops and uh, spend the whole talk exploring these uh, sections of the LMFDB. So the modular curves is not yet on either of the main LMFDB sites. You have to go to alpha.lmfdb.org to see it. Um, so I'm just going to briefly uh, show you what it looks like. So this is the modular curves database. Um, let me make this a bit bigger. Uh, if I can comprehend where a plus sign is on a French keyboard. All right, there it is. Maybe. There we go. Uh, so you can browse various families of modular curves that you're familiar with. So when you click on them, uh, you'll see here's the 70x1 of n's that we have in the database so far. Um, you can look for low degree points. So I'll come back to this a bit later. And you can search based on your favorite parameters for modular curves with certain properties. In addition to the modular curve section, there's also the abstract group section, which I'll also be talking about. So here, uh, currently, we have several hundred thousand groups. We're at, planning on adding more. Um, you can look for subgroups and quotients. Uh, and you can uh, search for specific things. So I'll come back to the details, but I just wanted to uh, encourage everyone to explore as we, as we talk about it. So I want to give you an idea of the scale of what data that we, that we want to have. So currently, the, the database includes modular curves of level up to 70 uh, that are defined over Q. So we're going to think about them um, and we're going to divide those into two parts. There are the curves that contain minus 1, and there are the curves uh, corresponding to, sorry, curves corresponding to subgroups of GL2Z hat that contain minus 1, and the curves corresponding to subgroups of GL2Z hat that don't contain minus 1. And uh, this slide just gives you an idea. Our goal over the next several months is to expand the database to curves of level up to 400, but that's far too many curves, so we're going to now restrict to genus up to 24. And so here you can see uh, about how many that is, so 25 million uh, modular curves. One interesting pattern that we noted uh, over the course of uh, uh, adding this data is that there's a very striking thing here when you look at the genus of modular curves uh, that are in the database. And notice that uh, there are a lot more odd genus curves than there are even genus curves. So I'll let everyone in the audience think about that. Uh, when I gave a talk about this a couple months ago, uh, the night before, we asked Jordan Ellenberg for, uh, for an explanation of this. And he came back half an hour later. And so you have half an hour. <laughs> <laughs> it is possible. It is possible. <laughs> yeah, that, that's a strategy, but he's probably sleeping. Um, so uh, this is just a kind of a picture of kind of how many curves there are of, of different levels and genuses. So you can see the vertical stripes where kind of we have a lot of curves of, of level 24, we have a lot of curves of level 40, curves of level 48, curves of level 60, um, and then kind of the horizontal ones where you see the, the odd genuses are a little bit more prevalent than the even, so it's, though it's a little harder to see. So the size of the dot and the, the color correspond to a, a logarithmic scale on how many curves there are um, of that level in genus. 
So that's the kind of the, so the, and this of course is only up to level 70. This is what we have there right now, and, and we'll add more soon. What about groups? So the group database comes from, uh, at the moment, existing databases of, of finite groups. And I'll talk about what additional uh, benefits the LMFDB database provides over the next uh, half hour. Um, and uh, we're, so far, the, the groups in the database only go up to order 2,000, which if you've, you've worked with finite groups on a computer, you'll recognize that as the, the limit of the, the small groups database. Um, but we, we want to add more groups, especially because one of the main purposes of this groups database is to connect to other sections of the LMFDB. And we have a lot of Gawa groups that show up, and Gawa groups often get larger than size 2000, right? So we have a, a database of transitive groups that are there now. And then, of course, if you're a group theorist, maybe you're interested in simple groups, maybe you're interested in perfect groups. So there's various, maybe you're interested in groups that come from modular curves. So those would be subgroups of GL2 Z mod N. So there's a lot of finite groups that, that show up naturally in number theory. And, and we want to add a bunch of those. So kind of coming soon, we'll get about double the number of groups. But of, of course, they get much larger than the size 2000, and that complicates some of the computation. All right, so for the rest of the talk, I'm going to divide it in half. Uh, the first half, I'm going to talk briefly about modular curves. Um, of course, we've had some talks already this week about modular curves, so I'm going to focus on some of the kind of the issues that arose during the computation. And for the second half, I'll go and, and talk about the groups part. So, Classically, if you look at uh, Elisa's talk on, on Monday, we defined a modular curve as a, a um, corresponding to a congruent subgroup of PSL2Z. For us, we're going to kind of take a slightly broader perspective on what a modular curve is. We're going to think about uh, modular curves as being associated to open subgroups of GL2Z hat. And one benefit of that is that it makes the moduli interpretation very clear. So, Every modular curve, the points of that modular curve are going to correspond to elliptic curves to get that whose um, adelic Gower representation lands inside that particular uh, conjugacy class of, of subgroups. So uh, we're going to restrict to surjective determinant on the subgroup. That corresponds, as we heard earlier this week, to uh, looking at uh, curves that are defined over Q. So, in the next several years, we may drop that assumption, but for now, kind of that's what the data that we have is. And uh, each, of those, each of those groups, we saw in Abby's talk this morning that there's a label. Uh, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna focus on the label this morning, uh, but uh, the, the three main pieces are the level, the index, and the genus, and each of those kind of gives you some idea of how complicated the curve is in a different way. So what does the computation look like? How do we generate the data that goes into this database? There are sort of three kind of major parts to that. Um, and I'm going to only talk today, because of time, about a small piece of one of those parts. So the first part is you need to enumerate these 25 million curves. right? So what does that involve? That means you need to go and uh, for every n that you're interested in, for every level, you look at GL2 Z mod n. And you try to list the subgroups up to conjugacy. Well, Magma has tools for doing this, but if you, if you ask Magma for the subgroups up to conjugacy of, of GL2 Z mod 36, uh, 336, it will not succeed. Um, so Drew has spent a lot of time over the last year, or more, uh, yeah, more than a year, um, writing code specifically focused on enumerating subgroups of, of GL2 Z mod n. Um, and so that's the first stage. You kind of you find the lattice of subgroups. So not only the list of subgroups, but also the inclusion relationships between them, because those inclusion relationships give you the modular maps, kind of that that are that are really important when you're thinking about modular curves. The second stage is a lot of the invariants that you might want to kind of compute associated to a modular curve come with matching that modular curve with with modular forms. So uh, for each of those uh, curves that you found, you try to find the Jacobian as an abelian variety given by its decomposition into modular forms. 
And I'm not going to go into much detail here, but the main tool is that group theoretically you can count points and that lets you try to match up the L functions and, and try to kind of match those up. So um, we've succeeded in doing that for a, kind of many of these uh, curves. Not all, because sometimes the level involved, you need to look not at level n, but level n squared, and that, that makes it difficult. And finally, uh, after you have the, the information that you can compute group theoretically and the information you can, you can compute based on the kind of matching up with a decomposition of the Jacobian, there are some other things you might like, like models or uh, ganality computations, rational points. So that's a third stage where you take uh, a certain set of these modular curves and then you try to compute additional information about them. And uh, this work is ongoing. I'm only going to talk about one part of this, which is uh, what we've done for models. So the first kind of model is the model that we get from uh, fairly new code due to David Zywina. So that gives you, for each given a subgroup H of GL2Z mod n, it gives you a canonical model when that's possible, so in the non-hyperelliptic case, or in the hyperelliptic case, it gives you some other kind of embedding of that hyperelliptic curve in a large degree, um, uh, or large dimensional projective space, and based on the genus. So as the genus goes up, the, the dimension of the projective space goes up. So uh, that, that works by looking at uh, the corresponding modular, modular forms and looking at their Q expansions at different cusps. Uh, and I'm not going to go into much detail on that algorithm. Once you have that canonical model, well, you get a lot of equations. So you can find examples in, in the database where uh, there are hundreds of equations in this canonical model. So maybe instead of those hundreds of degree two equations or a bunch of degree two equations, you'd like a plane model. So we have three strategies we use to try to find plane models. So one possibility is you look at the actual kind of modular curves that underlie your, your, your sorry, the modular forms, that on, the space of modular forms that underlie the modular curve. And uh, your coordinates on your canonical model correspond to a certain set of those modular forms. And so you can pick, I mean, a simple thing to do would be pick three of those and see if you can look at the relationships between them. So that gives you a map from your canonical model to a projective plane. Now, that map is not always birational, so you need to try to uh, choose some appropriate combination of the linear combination of those modular forms in your basis to get a, a, a birational map to P2. But you can, you can try to do that. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, I mean, the reason it doesn't is just it takes too long, not that it theoretically doesn't work. A second option is basically just to project, right? So you have some, some curve in a large degree dimensional projective space, pick a point, project from it, keep going until you get to dimension two. Um, and uh, you can try to kind of make this a little bit cleaner. Um, and I'm going to try to speed up and uh, go into less detail. But the, for, finally, one thing you can do is, uh, a, a third thing you can do is in Magma, they have a gonal map. And you can use that to, to produce a, a, a plane model as well. For elliptic and hyperelliptic curves, well, you'd like to see elliptic or hyperelliptic models. Um, one complication that arises is sometimes that hyperelliptic model is, is not defined uh, over Q. All right, so I wanted to show uh, a couple of um, examples. So if you've, if you've thought about modular curves of kind of maybe level 13, so this is a if you think, if I ask you what are all the modular curves of level 13, well, you'll, you'll think of some famous ones, but there are a bunch more. Uh, and kind of here's uh, a search result page to, to show you what that looks like. Um, I mentioned that there was a way to search for rational points. 
So uh, this is an example where we look for interesting rational points. So a lot of these modular curves uh, have rational points. Their gene is zero. Um, they're just P1s. And the, the, most of the rational points that we've added to the database so far come from the LMFDB databases of elliptic curves. Uh, but if we're looking at, for more interesting rational points, we can restrict our genus to be at least two, so we don't get kind of infinite families. And we could say, well, I don't want CM, so that I drop that kind of source of rational points. Uh, and I don't want it to be cuspidal. Right? There's kind of a, another source of rational points. So here we get 495 uh, rational points on the curves in the database that are sort of more interesting ones. Now, uh, we plan to do a more of a point search. Kind of there, there hasn't been kind of any point search done based on the models that we found. So that's work to, to come. Uh, finally, I want to show you the, the home page of uh, an individual modular curve. So um, there's a bunch of invariants. Uh, there's level structure. You can see the decomposition into Jacobians with specific modular forms that are in the database. There are models, kind of a, a model in P5, a singular plane model. And in this case, the curve is geometrically hyperelliptic, but not hyperelliptic over Q. And so we have uh, a, another virus stress model. Information on rational points, uh, the map to the J line, which can get pretty big. And then, uh, we have all these 25 million modular curves, kind of, if, if you give a curve, like, how do you tell, like, how do you, as a human, understand what that curve, where that curve is? Well, it fits into a place with modular curves you might be from, more familiar with. So in this case, this modular curve of level 40 maps to genus 1 curves of level 20 and 40, and then you eventually get down to curves you might know, like x naught of 10, um, x naught of 2, and x naught. So what about groups? That's the other half of the talk. Um, so there are a lot of sources of, uh, of groups that, we're, that we are aiming to add. Um, and uh, I want to talk about one interesting piece of uh, mathematics that came up in this project. There were several, but I don't have a, a ton of time. So the, the one of the problems with working with these other databases is that we want to classify groups up to abstract isomorphism, whereas the group, the transitive group database is groups, is permutation groups. So those are groups up to isomorphism as permutation groups, so conjugacy within SN. And so if I give you a large collection of permutation groups and I want to determine which of them are isomorphic to each other, then you'd really like to have a hash function because pairwise isomorphism testing I mean, the isomorphism testing itself can be very slow, and pairwise means you have a quadratic number of tests that you need to do. So uh, one of the things that, that we needed for this project was uh, a hash function on groups that is fast to evaluate, um, invariant under isomorphism, um, and hopefully fairly well distinguishing between different, between different groups. So if you have two groups that are not isomorphic, then they will often give you different hash values. So here's a hash function that actually, that we settled on eventually, it works pretty well. Um, so there are certain easy cases where if it's small or if it's abelian, you kind of, you have other methods. But otherwise, uh, the main idea is that you enumerate the maximal subgroups up to conjugacy. And there are fast algorithms for doing this for finite groups. Uh, and then for each of those maximal subgroups, you look at its conjugacy classes, and you look at the multiset of orders and sizes, and then you just combine those. And as an indication of this, of how well this works, um, for groups of order 1536, where there are a lot of them, so here we have a, a kind of an enumeration of all, this, all the groups in the small groups data, uh, database, uh, there are about 408 million groups, and there are about 408 million distinct hash values. Um, the largest size of a cluster was 72. So this tool kind of was, was very important for, for letting us kind of uh, collapse groups up to abstract isomorphism. 
Right, so I just had a few examples of, uh, of using the, the, data, the new database. So suppose you want to look for what are all the groups that have automorphism group of, with 24 elements in it. So you can search based on that. There are 22 examples here. Um, if you, uh, we have a kind of a hand curated list of interesting groups. So here are some, uh, some interesting groups that showed up. If you have your own favorite interesting group, you should feel free to, uh, to talk to us and, and add this to the list. Um, one of the things that uh, I think is interesting and different about this database than a lot of existing ones is here we've spent a lot of time trying to compute the lattice of subgroups inside the group. And so what this means is that we, we only have 250,000 groups, but we have 86 million subgroups. And you can search for groups with a particular subgroup or groups with a particular quotient. And you can specify information about the subgroup, about the quotient, about the ambient group, uh, et cetera. And that I've found this useful when somebody's giving a talk and they describe a particular group. They say it's, it's a split product. It's kind of some subgroup of this group, the one that's a split product of blah, 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 blah. You can go and, and try and figure out more details about what it is. Um, and finally, no. Uh, finally, I just want to show you the homepage for an individual group. So, uh, in addition to some basic invariants, statistics on elements, and, and uh, we have some constructions about how you might build this group. Uh, various characteristic subgroups the lattice of subgroups up to conjugacy or subgroups up to automorphism. One of the, one of the things that we've spent a fair amount of time on here is trying to think about uh, subgroups up to automorphism instead of just up to conjugacy because for a lot of groups that drastically simplifies, simplifies the picture. Um, and then information on uh, supergroups. So you can see what is this a group a quotient of, what is this group a, a subgroup of. Um, Character tables, both complex and rational. All right, that's it. Are there any questions for David? Yeah, John. What do those two pictures represent? <laughs> so, uh, if you go to, oops, um, if you go to the a, a random modular curve, you can now click on the picture description, and it will tell, give you a description of what that picture means. So the same is true for for uh, for finite groups. Um, though I don't know that that has been merged into this particular branch. It's all right. It's in progress over the last 24 hours. David, David Lowry Dude has been working on this. But basically, the left-hand side, this is the fundamental domain, kind of truncated as the, the genus gets too big. On the right-hand side, these are each dot represents a conjugacy class inside the, inside the group. The, the layers represent how many prime divisors that conjugacy, the order of the conjugacy class has and the colors are also coming from the order. Are there any other questions or comments? So I see an impressive list of families of, uh, of modular curves. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was wondering, so these are, I suppose these are all for congruence subgroups of SL2Z, is that right? Uh, no, this is GL2. GL2, GL2. okay. Yeah. So in that case, uh, are there any plans of putting uh, like quotients of x naught by uh, atkin lehner involution? Absolutely, in there? it's just something we haven't gotten to yet. So, um, so far, the, the curves we have are just the ones that are kind of directly coming from a subgroup of GL two Z hat. But uh, quotients are kind of something we hope to add in the next year or two. Great, thanks. Are there any other questions or comments? Well, if not, let's thank David again.